Okay, I'm going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Mitty Figueredo. I'm the Deputy Director for Montgomery Parks. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for the November session of the Montgomery Park Speaker Series about the Underline, a 10 mile linear park in Miami. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few housekeeping notes. This session will be recorded and posted to our website for future viewing. We'll have a Q&A session immediately following the presentation, and you can submit questions via the Q&A box throughout the session, and we'll try to address as many of them as possible during the last 15 minutes. Um, some quick background on Montgomery Parks. We're a Department of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, a bi-county agency made up of Prince George's County Parks and Recreation and Planning Departments and Montgomery County Parks and Planning Departments. We manage 420 parks spanning 37,000 acres of parkland across the county, and we have hundreds of amenities from trails to lakes to historic sites, museums, and athletic facilities. Today's speaker session showcases how a small group of dedicated people were able to transform underutilized space below a portion of Miami's Metro Rail into a, an amazing and vibrant linear park. The 10 mile underline features walkways and bike paths, a dog walk, an urban gym, a stage, and plenty of urban greenery. To learn more about the underline, we're joined by the founder of the Friends of the Underline, Meg Daly, and principal at James Corner Field Operations, Isabel Gastia. Meg Daly is a full-time volunteer founder and president of the Friends of the Underline, a 501c3 nonprofit leading the initiative to transform the underutilized land below Miami's Metro Rail. Meg also serves as chair of the Underline Conservancy, also another 501c3, responsible for the maintenance, management, and programming of the Underline as a world-class trail and park facility. Meg has a BA in English from Vanderbilt University and has served on numerous philanthropic boards. Isabel Castilla is a principal at James Corner Field Operations with over 15 years of experience in landscape architecture. Her work concentrates on large scale transformative public realm projects that have an impact on the local community and the city at large. She's led work on the master plan and phase one for the underline in Miami, as well as various highline projects over the last 10 years, among other notable projects. She holds a master of landscape architecture and master of architecture degrees from University of Pennsylvania School of Design and a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University City of Puerto Rico. Uh, please join me in welcoming Meg Daly and Isabel Castilla, and uh, we will have time for questions following the presentation, and I'm very excited to hear it. So I will hand it off to you, Meg. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know that Isabel is one of the, one of the participants, um, so if she can chat, maybe she can tell us how she's listed because she's on a different computer. We had a little technical problem. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm excited to talk about our project. If you hear background noise, we have a tropical storm. Yes, it is Miami barreling down on the Atlantic on the East Coast. We are in Miami. So if you hear background noise, that's good because that means that our, our drains will not back up next to the building. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'll walk everybody through um, our project. Just one second. Okay, and when I get there, if you could tell me if you could see the screen, that would be great. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay, super. Um, so welcome to the Underline. Uh, we are in Miami, Florida, below um, our Metro Rail, which is our elevated train. And um, I lead the nonprofit organization, Friends of the Underline. You mentioned I'm a full-time volunteer. Um, I've been working on this project for almost a decade. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. I'll take you through the fun parts. I'll also take you through some of the challenging parts of leading the transformation of 120 acres below an active uh, transportation train above and running through eight transit corridor um, metro rail stations. Um, but we do have a very bold vision, um, and that's to create, build a better Miami that's more mobile, more safe, more equitable, and really sort of creating the future of this young city, connecting it through the underlying parks and transit. You know, we really believe these big projects uh, should solve big problems. This is a $140 million uh, capital project. 
um, focused on safety and mobility. This is a multimodal solution, the first multimodal corridor in Miami-Dade County. Uh, really focused also on resiliency. We're in the epicenter of climate change. It can be a demonstration project for how we can do better in building a more resilient community uh, with 120 acres of green space. The whole project is a pollinator uh, with multiple ways of mitigating stormwater, which I just talked about <laughs> bearing down on us right now. Um, one of our core values is diversity and inclusivity. Um, we have 63% of our population speak Spanish as a first language. We also have a number of Creole speakers, which are first generation, second generation Haitians who come here uh, to build a future for themselves in Miami and America. And the whole project is designed to be accessible for persons with all abilities. So health and wellness, this is a topic that you know we talk about all the time. How can we have active transportation is really one of those solutions for getting people to move more, walking and biking ambiently in their community. Walking their dog um, is a way to recreate, you know, without having formal recreation decisions every day. Connectivity, you know, Miami has been carved up like a lot of our communities by highways, uh, which disconnects communities. And we see this as a way to stitch together um, Miami through green infrastructure, uh, connecting so many diverse communities and impacting 250,000 residents and 14,000 businesses. So innovation, that is also one of our core values. Uh, the whole project will be Wi-Fi, so free Wi-Fi for those people who visit. 30% of Miami is not, um, does not have access to broadband. Uh, we also have innovative approaches to bring entrepreneurship um, to Miami. I'll talk about that. Um, so the underline is, was built and was supposed to be nine phases. Um, it's now three with the first phase now open, uh, which is a half mile long. The second phase is under construction is two and a quarter miles long. And then the remaining seven miles was just awarded to a design build team. Um, I hope that Isabel can join us. Um, she's part of that design build team. James Corner Field Operations was also part of our master planning process and did the design. It was a design and build lead on our first half mile. And you can see how the funding breaks out. So if you have any questions on that, uh, we can talk about it later. So one of the things that's really surprised us is the number of people who have experienced the underline, you know, since we've opened. Um, it was, you'll see some pictures, it was bleak. I mean, there was nothing there. And so there's this pent up demand to come play here, recreate here. And we've already had a million and a half visitors in the first year. A lot of that's because we're connected to transit. Um, when we're done with the 10 miles, we expect over 9 million uh, visitors annually. Uh, we've planted 30,000 native plants and trees. Um, by the time we're done, we'll have a total of 500,000 plants and trees. 20,000 dog bags. Like, I can't get my head around that every day. 60% of the people visiting um, are walking their dogs, which is also great for meeting someone. So we'll look at close to 500,000 dog bags used annually when completed. Right now we're pacing 12,000 Wi-Fi connections. We have 15,000 Instagram followers. Our operating budget will um, explode to 10 million annually. Um, and we'll be looking at a thousand events a year. Uh, right now we're programming one of three um, days out of the week. No, one, of, one out of every three, three days. And we have four artworks and then we'll have a complete public art trail on completion. You know, this really is a slice of Miami. Um, it's a little bit younger. Um, the people within who are visiting and nearby are between 20 to 40 years old. 60% of them speak Spanish as a first language. And it's interesting because the people in the, visiting the underline in many cases are different, like different than the people who live here. A lot of that's because of the programs, a lot of that's because of the transit connection, um, but the people who visit uh, close to 40% make less than $50,000 a year. If you zoom out, and I'll try to describe this since you don't live here, 
Uh, the underline is this green line right here below Metro Rail. It's connecting to a couple other trail systems, creating what we're calling the Miami Loop. And it's also connecting to um, a growing, oops, a growing transportation system um, that is future looking, um, including a South Dade Transit Way, sort of going or north, south, east, west. We think of the underline as the spine of this system. We've been polling since day one. Um, and, the, and the priorities for our visitors um, have been consistent. Safety first, mobility and connect, connectivity second, and exercise in nature third, and just about everything else is um, fourth. You are not here, but if you were, you were here, this is what you would see. I don't guess um, Isabel has been able, able to- I, I am here, Meg, can you hear me? Yay, you're here, thank you. Um, Sorry, apologies for that. Um, major no. technological problems, but I am here. Oh, <laughs> um, excellent. So I'm glad you got here. So why don't, why don't you tell me how to advance these slides? You just say next. Why don't you talk about when you first got here and what this looked like? Sure. So as Meg is um, showing on her screen, um, this is what we first saw when we arrived at the underline. And the two pillars that you see in the center are the columns of the metro rail, which um, transverses above the plot of land where we are building um, the work. And what you see from this picture is pretty much a patch of grass or a patch of dirt. Um, it's surrounded by uh, trees that were in bad state. Um, many people ended up uh, using this area as an illegal parking lot and also full of utilities. So not only a large underutilized space, but also because of a state, a space that was perceived as a divisive state from, from, from one place to the other. People were not couldn't cross this area and really felt, um, felt it as a division. So if we move on to the next slide, um, you can get a picture of what we've done today with the first phase. Um, we call this the Brickle Backyard and this first phase, as Meg mentioned originally, is half a mile, um, located in the neighborhood of Brickle in Miami. And for, to give you some context for those who are not familiar with Miami, Brickle is one of the largest growing neighborhoods right now. Over the course of the last 10 years, there's been a large amount of new developments, many of those residential that have developed in this area. However, public space was not developed in par with that growth in population. So we decided to begin the first phase here and basically call it a backyard. The backyard of those that live in Brickle, but also the backyard of those that live in the larger Miami area that through access to public transportation can actually use this first phase of the underline. And what we did is we organized this as a series of rooms as we would call it to be able to ensure that there was a variety of different spaces and uses for everybody that lived nearby. So looking on the top left of the image, we have our first room, which we call the river room, a space that's more of a contemplative space that engages and directly provides views to the Miami River. In the center is what we call the gym. This is a space for recreation that includes a basketball hoop, two soccer goals, a running track, and a number of other exercise equipment, understanding uh, requests that we received from the community to provide a space for um, health and fitness. On the top right, we see what we call the promenade. This is one of the largest spaces and one that is not only connected to the main entry and exit of the Metro Rail, but it's also a space that's surrounded by um, bus and trolley stops, as you see on this image. So the idea with this space was to create a social space that would provide a variety of different sitting opportunities for people using public transportation, but also as we see on the lower left, spaces that would also be recreational and social with ping pong tables, um, tables for eating outside, and even the stage that provides areas for programming. And then the last two images on the bottom right, this is our last room, the Ulite room. And the name of the Ulite Room comes out of um, the Ulitic Stone Ridge that exists in the area. Uh, Ulitic Limestone is a, is a stone that's characteristic of Miami. And when the Metro Rail was first installed, they exposed the Stone Ridge. So we really wanted to create a room that would celebrate that basically by creating a series of native gardens alongside the Ulitic space and using also um, Ulitic Stones to create social spaces for a moment of pause, as you see, on the bottom right. 
So this creates or expands that strolling space out to um, the Metro Rail. And again, with this, creating a series of different rooms, different variety of spaces, different variety of programs that can really provide a space for everybody that lives in Brickell as well as Miami at large. Thank you, Isabel. I'm so glad you are able to join. You do such a great job telling our story. Um, so I'll talk about some of the activations that we've had. I mentioned that we're programming one out of three days. Um, and we're also looking at this first half mile as a test of what people really want to do here. And we'll get into how we get feedback on that. But we've had Upper Left, we've had Miami City Ballet perform. Uh, we've had high school marching bands. Uh, we've, had, we've had a reggae festival. Um, we're working on a global music series right now, which um, taps into music from around the world. Uh, we have an application that kids are using that they look at the underlying as sort of a, a way to discover artifacts and history of Miami through this app. Uh, the upper right is um, one of the four artworks I mentioned. This is a 70 foot uh, wide mural that um, was on a, a gray wall, just sort of this um, equipment holder and it, in a very foreboding, ugly space. Very beautiful now, I'll tell that story a little bit later. Um, every month we have family day, bottom left, Pick kids come out and play with these adult size Legos. Um, it's grown to including um, art classes, uh, book readings, and we usually have 200 to 300 kids for every one of those events. Um, 10 high school students uh, launched their businesses on the underline. Um, Malik on the bottom right is now at Howard University. And before he started this program, he didn't think that he could go to college. So we've had great stories come out of the entrepreneurship program for students. Bottom right, if you scan uh, one of these barcodes along the underline, um, there's some storytelling about why we have certain kinds of plants and what we're doing to remediate stormwater, as well as we're one of the only places that recycles at public parks in um, Miami. So this is phase two. Um, this is the before, this is two and a quarter miles long. It's now um, under construction. And that's the, um, that area is the, one of the many flood crossovers, pedestrian bridges that we have across US-1 which now runs along this section, which is a major arterial road. And the underline is below Metro Rail alongside U US-1, so it is an off-road facility. Um, top left is we have a nature-inspired playground going in, um, which was just this dead zone. Um, by the way, I need to mention we're open 24 hours a day. We never close, um, except for that gym, which closes at 10 p.m., and it's the only area that's fenced. Um, top right, we have... Um, in the playground, we have areas for younger kids, older kids. Uh, we also have a sensorial garden. Uh, we'll have baby yoga, all sorts of things coming when we open. Bottom left, we have a labyrinth um, in that area that you saw earlier near that Vizcaya station flyover. And then bottom right, uh, right alongside US-1, that major arterial and next to a, a little city street will be one of first of many, many bioswales. Uh, for stormwater mitigation. Um, we do intercept studies. Um, I, I guess you guys know what it's like to sort of grab someone as they're trying to go to yoga class and ask them if, they'll answer, if you'll answer some questions. Um, they're not really excited about it, but we've gotten some great information back from them. Two of the ones I like the most are that over 60% of the visitors meet someone new. And then the other is that 35% um, picked up litter. And what does that mean? is that you know, you're building a stronger civic fabric. Uh, and that's that way I talked about stitching together a community in this green space, which is really a place because of the people that come. So here's what, oops, let me see what I did. Okay, so I talked about what you would see if you came, and now I wanna talk about what you won't see, which is all that work preparing for the design um, stage. And I'm gonna have Isabel jump in here. Sure, thank you, Meg. Um, so when we first approached the design of the project, you know, Meg approached us as a design team and said, we wanna do a multimodal trail. We, the trail should prioritize um, safety, 
But we also pose the question, well, what else can it be? We have 10 miles to work with um, for a very successful, for a public space to be very successful, we must add different layers of interest, different ways in which it can perform. And as the beginning few weeks of our master plan process, we launched into a series of public meetings, which is this image that you see here, that we determined would be listening sessions. Basically, the idea being um, before we formulated any ideas, we wanted to hear from the public what would be their priorities for this project that at that time was pretty much innovative. There wasn't a, a clear idea of what it would be. And um, what you see on these panels is you see a number of stickers, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the way in which we develop public meetings where we ask people what they would prioritize. But the other level of, of detail behind these stickers is that you can see different colors. That's because the underline being 10 miles long actually um, required us that we do this meeting as a, as, a, as a show where we actually went to three different cities uh, to make sure we receive feedback from as many community members as possible. And the different stickers, the different colors were assigned to the different cities. Blue, for example, being city of Miami versus um, yellow being city of Coral Gables. And what we obtained out of that process was that there was an overall consensus on using the underline or designing the underline as a place that would be a, an ecological corridor that really prioritized nature and prioritized exercise and well-being, as we see on these images. But it, what also came through is that different communities also had other different priorities. Brickle, for example, um, really wanted to connect to nature to have spaces that would be contemplative versus City of Coral Gables, for example, really wanted spaces that would expose uh, sustainable technologies and would really talk about the future of public space. So through that process, we really started um, creating a framework for what the underline would be creating a series of design ideas that would be cohesive along the corridor that were those priorities that were um, a consensus amongst all citizens, but also creating diverse opportunities for programs that were driven by what different communities told us they needed the most. If we move on to the next image, another thing we wanted to do was not to prescribe the conversation, but also to allow um, the neighbors and the neighborhood to tell us what else they wanted, what other ideas could we consider in this project that perhaps were not prompts that we had on those boards. And this is what we call the graffiti board, where we really allowed people to just express their ideas. Interesting story with this is that in the middle of this public meeting process, we realized we needed to print double the amount of graffiti boards because everybody really gravitated to them and really wanted to express their ideas and kind of ran out of space. Um, and some of the interesting things that we got out of this is that people started talking to each other through these uh, boards. If you see um, on this image, there's this big um, drawing of two trees and big words that say plant trees in straight rows. And then another citizen right beneath it say, no, make it a, a naturalistic, organic, real Florida hardwood hammock. So through this, people actually started interacting with each other and in a way creating a sense of community understanding everybody perhaps had different ideas, different perspectives, but we all had to come to consensus on overarching goals to be able to accomplish this goal, this project and get it implemented. Next. So that public process allowed us to create the big picture, the framework of the project. And then came for us the next task as we started developing the first phase of the underline that was shortly about to be built, was to understand what people specifically wanted of that space. How could we program that space, both with areas that could be used on the day-to-day, -day, like the basketball court, for example, but also other types of programming, children's activities, um, health activities to ensure that everybody would come to the underline and would activate the space. And these photos that you see here are these round tables that we had with neighbors of the area. So they could give us their ideas of what they wanted to see. And we could again dissect what would be a permanent implementation versus where we would perhaps incorporate infrastructure to allow for these other more um, temporary events to occur as well. Thanks, Isabel. I don't know if you all noticed, but um, all of the instructions on those boards were in English and Spanish. Um, and the other thing is that I, I love looking back at these from six years ago. All of the ideas that we have in the underline came from the people who came to these meetings. It's like soccer, check. <laughs> you know, we want more tr native trees, check. So it's very um, affirming to revisit those notes. So we also really created a movement. Um, I mentioned that I'm a volunteer, but I'm surrounded by an entire tribe of volunteers. 
So we just sort of took to the streets. We had we would take the underlying the, the space as it was and turn it into a four hour festival and return it to what it was again, where we had face painting for kids, we had art classes, we had decorate bikes, we had uh, the upper top one, we had a bike fashion show one time. Uh, we gave bike, did bike giveaways. Um, these orange pictures like look like a stage bottom right and top center. Um, the University of Miami School of Architecture built a pop-up stage during Art Basel and programmed it for three days with music and dance and, and performances representing the, the hundreds of the many, many communities here. Uh, we are, were awarded an Art Place America grant um, and um, had four local artists um, bring public art to the space before it was ever built. Uh, the top left, that's an artist inspired jungle gym. It was very popular. It was actually written up in New York Times. And then if you, I don't know if you noticed, but like towards the center, there are these sort of eerie looking four columns that are lit up in, in pink. That was actually a grant that we got from a local foundation that would show what this would look like if it were lit. And there are 400, almost 500 columns along the 10 miles and nobody had ever seen it lit before because there was no lighting, no water, no infrastructure. And this is alongside US-1. And one day they turned on and they were, instead of being green or blue, they turned on and they were red, pink and people thought it was a stoplight telling them to stop. And for if you're a bit visited Miami, you know, we don't stop at stoplights here. So that was sort of interesting that people were willing to stop at, a, at an art installation. So I'll talk about funding and the message really is that if you if you're so intentional about listening to people when you need them to show up for you. This was about a month ago, the award of phase three by the Board of County Commission, we had 30 people and another 40 waiting outside. Um, they had a capacity um, issue with the with the room that day um, and what you don't see is the commissioners. And they're looking at us. And this is a picture that one of the commissioners took looking at us. They had all left their chairs and moved to the center of the dais so they could see the woman with her, with her safety dog, the two children who were homeschooled, uh, the faces of Miami coming out to say that they support the commissioners awarding this project that day. It passed unanimously. My message to you is bring your community with you um, if you're good to them, they'll be good to you. You also, I mean, you guys see operations. So I'll tell you the story about um, a no name storm in June, which was not supposed to do much, except it did a lot more. We had about um, four feet of, of um, rain, four inches of rain, four to six inches of rain. The city streets next to the underlying flooded and they crested in the middle of the underline and when they withdrew it looked like what happens when a beach high tide low tide we actually had a mattress we had movement of traffic equipment which is these big big sort of pontoons had floated onto the underline um i mentioned we're open 24 hours a day and we have 24 hours security and 18 hours of maintenance and because of the way the underlines planned with the storm water um approach we have deep injection wells it also has a slight grade so it drains faster into the city streets we were the only park in the area that was able to open so people could come out and walk their dogs again construction so in phase two which is under construction you know i'm going to talk to you about lessons learned phase two is a design build project uh, phase one was design bid build and, des and in phase one we had construction fences with signage on every one of the construction fences and the contractor in phase two decided not to use construction fences and there was very limited construct um, signage. So when construction started and people were upset about tree removal or tree um, moving to a different location, um, there wasn't enough information out. One neighbor complained to the City of Miami Commission in, an, in, a, in really a public comment session, and our entire funding from the City of Miami was frozen. That was $15 million. 
So we had to go back to the commission three times to get our um, funding unfrozen. We had to do a lot better job of communicating out why trees were being removed or relocated or kept. Many of them were kept in place. And even despite the fact that we were planting four to one new, plant, new trees to those removed, it was just, the, I think, a poor communication. So we lesson learned, we really changed our communication blueprint for phase three. We're adding more public meetings and dedicating one just to plants and trees and landscape. So I talked about technology, which was not planned for this project. We did not plan Wi-Fi. Uh, we have a local provider providing free Wi-Fi to anyone who visits the underline. So we had to add poles in phase one just to support the Wi-Fi antenna, future phases, Wi-Fi, fiber, and all of the wiring is included in the light fixtures. So I've talked about you know, what you see when you visit the underline, and I'll, I'll tell you what we see. 24 hours a day, we see joy. And these are the faces of the people that I see on a regular basis here. Um, Andrew Millen, who lives about 10 miles south of here in Daveland, which is the southern terminus of the full 10 miles. He says, if you're looking for new friends and engaging people from all walks of life across all backgrounds, come to the underline. One of those parents at family day travels every time here to come for family day. She comes 20 miles away. She says, but I come here for the kids programs and the sense of community. Gloria is one of our volunteers. She lives right here in Brickell. She says volunteering in the day in the dirt gives us an opportunity to improve and beautify our neighborhood with greenery and flowers. Alex Larmier is a realtor. He leads our uh, free bike rides. And he says, my favorite thing about the underline is that it provides families, little kids, and older people that usually usually would be too scared to bike the chance to connect to each other in their neighborhoods. By the way, Miami-Dade County is one of the most dangerous places to walk and bike in the country. And of the top 14 list of most dangerous places, six of them are in the state of Florida. So we have a lot of work to do. Another Brickell resident says, I love the underline. This area wasn't really utilized before and it's become a big part of the neighborhood that's bringing together culture, community and urban design. Malik Roll, I talked about him. Um, he's there with his thumbs up. He said, it's been an amazing experience having my own business to sell snow cones and help my community by bringing positive vibes. Edney Jean Joseph, who did that mural I showed you earlier said it was truly special for me to have my art included in a public space that celebrates all of Miami. I feel seen. So that's our presentation. Um, I know I saw some really good questions. I'm excited. You guys have great questions. So I'm really excited to answer them. Would you guys like for me to stop the share? Yeah. I'll keep the screen. Well, stop share. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask my team for for what they think about that. Whether we should stop the share, maybe we can pull it back up if people have a question about a particular slide. Sure. Um, but but first of all, I, I want to thank both of you. And and something that I I did not share at the outset when I was doing the intro is that I'm from Miami originally. Um, my family still lives there. I grew up there mostly in the 1970s as a kid, and I you know I I visit regularly. Um, Miami's changed a lot over the last few decades um, for the better, but you know, it's still a built environment that is designed around cars and it's hard in that kind of, um, you know, in, 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 in an environment where everybody drives everywhere um, to connect with people socially, to have to find those public spaces where um, you know, you can you can gather and have these kinds of impromptu exchanges that make city living so wonderful. Um, so it's beautiful to see that it's not just a space for um, physical activity or that creates, you know, um, mobility and, and new connections, but that it's become a place for people to gather socially and connect with each other. And that's probably the most 
it seems to me like the most special thing of all. And I'm planning to visit family in December. And this is like at the top of my list. I really want to spend spend some time there. Um, so I, I do want to move to some questions. I have a start, I have a starter question, um, which is do you, how many people, what have you, do you have a target for um, a mode share, for uh, achieving a specific mode share for people arriving at the underline? Um, because Miami being so auto oriented, I'm wondering how most people are still getting there, if they're mostly driving and if you have any specific goals on um, connecting people um, to the underline via transit. That's a great question. Um, we now have a study um, being done by the Knight Foundation, which is a local foundation, but they're national, they're based here. And they're doing this study using people's um, smartphones to identify how they're getting to the underline and where they're coming from. We're totally porous. So it's not like we can close the gate, open the gate, and then ask people where they came from. Um, uh, anecdotally, you know, we have what's called a SUFA board. It's a digital display that counts the people come by, who come by, and there are hot spots as people get off the train. So we're finding there's there's three ways that people get here. One is they come from everywhere. So 50% of the people who visit the underline are not from the neighborhood. So the other 50% are coming from the neighborhood and just getting here. So I would say that it's, I don't know, it's probably like a 40-60 a split mass transit or walking and biking or, um, or coming by car. And we don't have that broken out, but we're working on it from that study from Knight Foundation. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I also want to ask you, and this is in the just genuine you know, working for a parks department, we have a pretty large cap, six-year capital budget and then, you know, a healthy operating budget, but, but a lot of parkland and a lot of projects. And so I'm always interested in the money. Um, so I do want to understand a little bit more um, the, the funding sources for, you know, for your construction versus your operations between tax supported funding and other sources of funds like fundraising and and if you could just break that down a little bit more and mm -hmm. and related to that how did you get the support for that level of funding because i think i saw that 77 million dollars came from miami dade county i mean that's a healthy chunk of capital mm -hmm. funding um well so the good the good news is i don't know what i'm doing and and that <laughs> and if i really knew what i was doing you know maybe we wouldn't have done it it would have been um, more daunting right yeah, and they're like, ah, it can't be done. And then when we open, they're like, oh, I never thought it would happen. I'm like, glad you didn't say that before. Um, so, you know, we're really scrappy and um, started the project under the auspices of the county parks department. And then we're switched over to um, the project within the domain of the transportation department. And that's a really kind of complicated um, dynamic because you know, you're dealing with, you know, love park people, right? You get parks. And so this project is seen as this hybrid park and transportation solution. The bulk of the funds have come from transportation dollars. It's on county land. Um, and so that's that investment. So yeah. the 77 million is from road impact fees and road impact fees had never been used for a park facility. Um, our nonprofit paid for a study to show that the underlying would increase road capacity by getting cars off of roads using walking and biking as an alternative to driving um, a five percent decrease so they're like check that box we can now use road impact fees for a increased capacity uh, we have park impact fees from the city of miami and coral gables they've never directed park impact fees to a county project uh, we also were the only um trail project to be awarded a build grant in 2019. Um, the funny story about that, in 2018, we asked for $9 million um, and we didn't get it. So in 2019, we applied again and said, we didn't, we didn't get it last year, so we're gonna triple our ask. So we asked for 23 million and we were awarded the 23 million. What that federal grant did was accelerate our project. So the whole project was used as a match 
So it wasn't just a phase had to be completed by 2025, 26, the entire 10 miles did. And so that's why it's three phases now instead of nine. Um, and then we have some, you know, sort of miscellaneous and sundry other um, public dollars in there. Um, the, the split for operations is roughly 70% public money, 30% uh, private. And so our organization is responsible for all the private funding. And we also oversee the conservancy, which operates and maintains. Okay. Um, so related well, that, was, to that was the simple answer. That yeah, was, no, I, 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 that was I the cliff it, notes on this. <laughs> I, 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 I bet it is. I, I bet it is. I'm sure that the real story was a lot more complicated. Um, but, you know, related to the funding, you can't get funding if people don't like your project and support it. So I want to ask a little bit, too, about um, did you encounter, and I'm guessing the answer is yes, because there's always opposition to anything new, but did you encounter opposition and where did it come from and, and how did you handle that? And then on the other side, because you were talking about a coalition that you built of people who were, you know, you listened to them and you offered them what they wanted. And then when you needed them, they came and they supported you. Who were some of the people who make up that coalition? So it's kind of like a two-parter. Well, since day one, you know, people could sign up for the underline for free, join, and then they would check a box, I wanna be a volunteer. So I think one of our strengths is asking for help um, because if you offer, you know, be careful what you ask for because we're probably gonna take you up on it. Um, we have close to 1400 volunteers have signed up over the past six years. Obviously there's turnover in that. Um, and, and they really do come out and offer their time and talent. Um, the second is, you know, is what do they look like? You know, what's their composition? And it's so varied. Um, you know, we have families with children, we have young moms, we have um, retirees. There was in one of those pictures, it's these two cyclists that start in Brickell and they ride their bikes 21 miles every day. And they can't wait for the 10 miles of the underline to be done because they can just go round trip and not have to do any city street driving. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, we are, I, I chair two boards um, within just the board and the committee composition. We have close to 100 volunteers right there. Um, so volunteerism is really our currency. Um, what was the no? The no is, I would say that, you know, Miami-Dade County is huge. It's the size of a couple of small states. Um, and the way that we're set up in terms of our governance is the county has districts within it. And so someone in that far corner, you know, who's saying, I want the underline in my, in my, in my district, and we're not in their district, they could sort of be a little squeaky wheel, but we would point out to them, it's likely that your residents are coming to the underline and using it when they come to work. And so, and, and because of our polling, we can no, go back to Joe Martinez and say that 20% of our guests are coming from district 13 and he smiles, right? They just, they have to say, okay, you know, I told you, I told you the no, you got me to yes. And I would say along those lines, um, again, because of all the great community engagement work and volunteerism work, in the end, the majority of the community embraced the underline. They didn't know what it would be, and they were pleasantly surprised when they saw it. So from the community, there wasn't much opposition. I would say from the governmental agencies, there was a lot of nervousness over what would this be and what does this mean? Imagine we are turning a piece of land that was intended to be an empty piece of land to allow maintenance vehicles to inspect the train into a public space. I think that was our biggest challenge. I wouldn't characterize it as opposition, but the bigger challenge to, to demonstrate to people how we would make this transformation in a safe and successful way that still um, addressed all of their concerns over security, over maintenance, while still, um, I would say, breaking the boundaries of what a public space would be. I mean, some of the questions we got were, 
are you sure someone's going to want to sit on that bench with the loud train above head? And we said, well, people walk by it every day. People wait for the bus by it every day. What is the difference between sitting on a bench waiting for the bus versus sitting on a bench having a sandwich for your lunch break? So those were kind of, I would say, our biggest challenges is just changing the mindset of what a public space is. There's, um, we're used to beautiful public spaces in large swaths of land that can afford a lot of nature. And, and we're here reinventing the wheel a little bit on, on what that means in a dense urban environment that's somewhat a little bit more infrastructural. Um, but I would say, I think through um, listening, as much as we listen to the community, to also listening to all of our stakeholders, all of their concerns and working closely with them, we were able to create a design that they ultimately are happy and they also feel proud of. They feel like they were part of it as well. I think Isabel brings up a really good point and the bottom line is trust. Um, you know, we were an unknown sort of grab, you know, sort of grassroots organization that had I had never met an elected official until I started this project. Um, and, you know, I'm just nobody. And, and we went into meetings where city representatives interagency with cities had never met each other. So we were bringing and these organizations that were siloed together through an unknown, you know, citizen. And it took time, you know, to build that trust. Um, another great story is one of our early, um, one of our early volunteers had moved from New York and she loved the High Line. And she's now the commission, the district commissioner for our neighborhood. Oh, so it's sort of like, yeah, it's like this grassroots movement yeah. then turned into her passion for politics. And she's a, she's a tremendous elected official. I, I like what you said about, and, and this, it, it really is food for thought, um, engaging people by asking for their help. And then I think when people put a little sweat equity into something, they have a sense of ownership for it and then they, they want it. And sometimes in government, we think, well, it's our job to just provide but bringing people into the process, I think, can really make them sort of want to com com commit them to success. I, it seems like uh, something that you did have going for you is that you weren't really taking a space and taking something away to turn it into something else, which is sometimes presents a whole new set of challenges. But it still says a lot that people weren't more afraid of the unknown. Um, and this does lead me to um, a question I have, and, and somebody also has a question in the chat, because um, I'm characterizing sometimes some things as my questions that are really just questions we're getting into. Um, about public safety and because you know you're saying it's it's open all the time which you know it seems kind of in, innovative um you know a, a different kind of idea for a public space um it, you know and how do you how do you how are you keeping the space safe does that depend a lot on the fact that there are so many people in it um but also issues that a lot of cities are dealing with that we're dealing with here you know in Washington DC um which is homelessness and and the homeless population you know mo moving into a space and how do you ha have you seen that as an issue and how have you been handling that I mean, hundred percent. I mean, it's across the. We're we're members of the Highline Network, which is a group of industrial reuse projects. We're now hundred strong, and the convening was here um, in Miami recently, and that topic was um, you know front and center uh, because there is a a the cost of housing um, and housing stock has has gone up gone up substantially. Miami is one of the most expensive places to live with the cost of transportation and housing. So A, people being forced onto the streets because of a growing and stronger economy and, and housing market. Um, there's also, there seems to be a growing issue, not just with mental health issues, but also with, um, with the presence of drugs and, and the growing um, epidemic pandemic we have with you know, fentanyl, whatever we call it, it's a crisis. So, I mean, I look out my window to my right and the underline is right there. So there are a lot of people who do not pay, who make people feel safe because they're not a threat. Um, people are not allowed to sleep on the underline. They're not allowed to smoke or drink. As long as you are peaceful and making pe not making people feel unsafe, you are welcome here. 
whether you have a roof over your head or not. Um, and however, if your behavior makes someone else feel unsafe, then we have to do something about it. We have security that's unarmed. They're here 24 hours a day. They know a lot of the, a lot of the people here by first name. And um, if someone seems like they need to be, you know, we need to call in the police, we will, first responders or municipal. Um, and it, it has been a growing concern. We, we now have unfortunately had to train our staff and, you know, how to, how to address if you feel unsafe. Um, but there, it's been, it's been a growing problem. Um, this is probably the most complicated and dense area. Um, there are other areas of Miami have much worse problems and it's really because we do have 24 hour security. Our security was supposed to be short term. It was supposed to be tied to when we open and now it looks like it's permanent. I appreciate you addressing that honestly, because I, I, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, as local government officials that, you know, we're, we're struggling with, I think across the country more and more how to, how to handle public safety and homelessness in a way that's compassionate, but also. Oh, it has to be safe. compassionate. Yeah. And, you know, and what, and we thought when we polled people, what does safety mean to you? It was all always safety around, around bicycling and, and pedestrian safety. And now it's being feeling safe in place, yeah. no matter what time it is. And so, you know, that's something we've really grappled with. Um, there are local organizations um, that provide, you know, housing uh, for persons who are homeless. Um, there's the Homeless Trust. They don't do what you call a sweep. Some people call it a sweep. It's not, um, it's an education. And um, we've applied for a number of grants. Unfortunately, we haven't been awarded to have someone on staff um, every day um, building a rapport uh, with people to understand how we can help them and, and, and being a solution for their condition for this condition. Thank you. Um, I have, since we're a parks department, we have a lot of park staff watching this. Um, and parks lovers, we have some nitty gritty questions. Um, one of them is about how do maintenance vehicles access the space? How did you design for that? Because I've got a lot of operations and park planners who are very interested in answers to those kinds of questions, especially as we design more and more urban parks. I'll have Isabel. I will take that. that <laughs> she had to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, so um, an interesting story about the underlying is that the, the path that's there right now before we transform it into this project is called the M path. And M stands for maintenance path. And it was originally built by the Metrorail to allow their maintenance vehicles to travel through and inspect the, the guideway, which meant that when we started designing the project, that was the first request we received. We need to ensure all the maintenance vehicles have uh, uninterrupted and clear access to the space. Lucky enough, we have a park that is a multimodal trail that has two paths, one for pedestrians and one for cyclists. So when we decided to establish um, the dimensions of the path, we took into consideration not only allowing for these multiple modes of travel, um, slower versus faster, multiple directions, but also maintenance vehicles. And, and that's how we established the width of the path to ensure that if a maintenance vehicle needed to travel through, it would fit as much as a bicycle would fit and they would be able to bypass each other. The entire roadway um, or path of the underline is all designed uh, to hold um, heavy loads. So under no circumstance would there be a situation where a maintenance vehicle is not able to access it. That was part of it. May cost a little bit more money, but in the end, I think it's worth it because you're not creating limitations on access. And we also had other big challenges. Um, the entire electrical infrastructure of the trains is on what our underlying space is. And there were a large number of manholes that we had to preserve and that we had to provide access to. So we almost had weekly meetings with the material maintenance group to understand how they worked, really ask questions on where do you enter? Where do you exit? Can you turn around? Can you not turn around? And really kind of develop the entire layout to allow for that. You know, an interesting story of why we have um, one basketball hoop and not a full basketball court is because one of those maintenance um, areas is on the basketball court. 
and we could have fit a whole basketball um, court, um, but but the maintenance team was adamant about being able to have very easy access to that maintenance area. So we ended up designing a planter on the basketball court that hosts these maintenance, um, basically uh, manhole. So the public cannot access it, but the maintenance team knows where it is. And we designed the entire layout to allow for a, a um, a small crane to enter the space and be able to access that manhole in case there were maintenance and operations issues. So I would say a lot of creativity, but a lot of listening and collaboration and design studies, not taking this as a, as a, as a problem, but as something that informed design as much as any other aspect of the park would. That's great. Yeah, bringing the operations folks in and getting their feedback at the beginning is, is pretty, pretty critical. Um, so moving on to, uh, I do have, well, let me ask you this. Tell me a little bit about um, the Friends Group and how that came about and what was the impetus for organizing a Friends Group? What's their role, their ongoing role? Well, the Friends was a catch-all for everything. So okay. we, were, we were doing community work. We were doing fun, you know, private fundraising, public fund fundraising. Um, you know, government relations, you know, so it's really across the board. And then six, six months before we opened our first phase, we activated a second nonprofit, which is called the Underline Management Organization, also a 501c3. Uh, we just went through a strategic planning process about a year ago that gave form and definition to the two organizations. So we're, we're our friends was sort of like this put it all there, we split the baby. And Friends is primarily a fundraising organization and advocacy. And the underlying management organization is not a fundraising organization, it's an operator. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for one more. I'm gonna ask one more question before I, I let you go. Um, tell me more about, um, cause you're saying you, it's, you pro, it's, it's programmed how how frequently? Two out of every three. You one out of every three days. We have, one out of every three. One out of every three days. We have at least one program going on. Sometimes we have four at the same time. Do you partner? Who who's who does the programming? Do you partner with outside community groups to come in and do the programming? How does that work? It's a mix. Okay. Um, so basically, you can say that we produce our own events sometimes, top to bottom. Um, we're learning that we're better with other organizations that, you know, really know how to do this. Um, um, a local, well, a local regional um, hospital is our exclusive health and wellness um, programming partner. So everything from yoga to Zumba, you know, we had to go virtual on a lot of this for some time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's really a mix where we're producers and in some cases we're co-producers and we're trying to get to the place that we are just the place and somebody else produces. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, if people want to come in and use the space, do they, do they, do they need to get a permit? If somebody wants to come and have their own event there, is that possible? And how do they? Yeah. So we can self permit. Okay. Um, okay. so it, and we have all those privileges. We can actually serve alcohol on the underline if we choose to. If you if you have an event and you want to, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, and what we want to be able to do is have some sort of technology that allows someone ten miles from here, down at you know the southern end of the underline, be able to program his or her own yoga class. And instead of having forty phone calls and twenty emails to do that, we'd love to have technology be able to be the interface for that. Well, I just want to thank both of you for this presentation. This is just near and dear to my heart. I love what you did for mobility, for bike and pedestrian safety, for bringing people together in a city like Miami that's so vibrant and diverse, but hasn't always you know, been able to create these kind of spaces for people, for beauty, for just beautifying the city. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And so, um, you know, on behalf of Montgomery Parks and all the attendees um, today, Thank you. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for coming and telling us all about it. It's an inspiration to us. And, you know, I, I hope to connect with both of you one day in the future and let you know about some of the things that we're doing here. And we'll, we'll, we'll take, we've, we're taking notes. So um, again, thanks Thank again. You. I just want to say that everybody is invited to the underline. So 
you know, leave your winters behind and come visit my <laughs> Knock on that, our door. That'll be very tempting in January. <laughs> Trust You're me. all welcome here. And, you know, we're all just trying to get better together. So um, any way that we can be a resource, vice versa, you offered to help, we'll take you up on it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to let everyone on on right now know that um, our next speaker series takes place in December, and it's about teen programs that are available at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, we will be sharing more information about the date and time, so stay tuned. And thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful day, and good luck with the storm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Isabel. Thank Bye. you.